Okay, <clears throat> Connect Group Teachers, it is Thursday evening, and we have been in Tybee Island all week, and so we come back home tomorrow, but I wanted to get you a video out, even though I don't have the book, the curriculum book, with me to really evaluate what they're saying too much. Adam did send me a couple pages, but I just looked at the first part. Mainly, I just want to walk you through the passage, bring out some things, whether it's brung out, brung out in the curriculum book or not, I don't know. But um, Acts chapter 8, <clears throat> verses 26 through 39 is the passage. This is Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, you really need to back up, as always, because I think it's really important that we understand the theme of this passage. When I say theme, okay, we're talking about the book of Acts. And you always have to be asking yourself, why did Luke record this passage? I say that because the curriculum has the title of your message as baptizing. And although the baptism of the Ethiopian eunuch is in this passage, that's not the key. I say that because very simply, why did Luke put this particular passage, this event, in his book? Well, we go back to Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which is the the Great Commission, go ye to all the world and preach the gospel. Um, where? In Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. And so what Acts, what Luke does in the book of Acts is he demonstrates how the apostles accomplished that. Chapter 2, Pentecost. Salvation comes down in a big way. The church is started. Those are Jews, primarily Jews. Certainly there were some proselytes in there, but that was a huge uh, establishment of the church within the within Jerusalem. It continues in Jerusalem, right? We've seen uh, three more thousand saved. We've seen um, many more being brought to Christ in these first early chapters, primarily in Jerusalem. You get to chapter 8, however, and in verse 1, it says, Saul approved of his execution, speaking of Stephen, and there arose in that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. They're still in Jerusalem. Are they supposed to stay in Jerusalem? No, and it seems as if God has to use persecution to get them out of Jerusalem and preaching into Judea and Samaria, and that's what happens. Um, Saul, uh, there rose a great day of persecution against the church in Jerusalem, and they're all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him, but Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Then the very next verse, we get introduced to Philip, often called Philip the Evangelist. And notice what Philip is doing. Now those who are scattered went about preaching the word. One of them that was scattered that went about preaching the word is Philip. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed to him, to them, the Christ. So finally, we've got the gospel going to Samaria. And Philip is preaching to large crowds. Verse 6, the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said by Philip when they heard him and saw the things that he did. So we've got Philip now proclaiming the gospel in Samaria to large crowds. This is very significant. Remember, Jerusalem, Judea, now Samaria. And where else were they to preach the gospel? To the outermost parts of the earth. So then we pick up in verse 26, and it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go towards the south, to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to, Ga to Ga Gaza. This is a desert place. And he arose and went, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. So here's the scene. Philip has been preaching in Samaria, to large crowds. He's got a large, uh, fruitful ministry going on. And then the Spirit of God, through an angel of the Lord, says to him, we want you to go south and speak to one man. One man. Oh, and he happens to be an Ethiopian. And your the curriculum will talk about, you know, exactly what that means. I'm not going to reiterate that. I did see that page. Adam sent that to me. But the bottom line is, and it's in the curriculum in that page Adam sent me, that <clears throat> to a Jew, 
this area that this Ethiopian eunuch is from would be considered the outermost parts of the earth. I mean, you know, they didn't have internet. They didn't have Google Maps. They didn't know how vast the earth was. So within their mindset, you're going down now to uh, Africa area. You're going down far away from Jerusalem and Judea. Now, he's not going down there, but God has brought someone to him. And it's to go to that one person. He went from crowds to one person. And so great application here is, is simply obeying the mission God has given you to do. We all have a mission. And that mission is to proclaim Christ, regardless of what your vocation is. And sometimes God allows people, a lot, a lot of times just preachers and pastors, but sometimes lay people, to have a fruitful ministry to large crowds. But are you willing to leave? This is what Philip did. He left a fruitful ministry ministering to thousands of people to go speak to one person. Now, at the end of the passage, he's going to be taken up, raptured actually, caught up away from this Ethiopian eunuch after he baptizes him, and he's going to land and find himself in Azotus and again, you know, continue his ministry to other people. But as we as we look at this a little bit closer, um, I want you to think of this. One person is just as worthy of hearing the gospel as vast crowds. And who knows what that one person will accomplish. Just to get ahead of myself a little bit, because I was going to share this later. That We're not told what happened with that eunuch, but he got saved. He went on his way rejoicing at the end of this text. And there's no doubt in my mind he was instrumental in evangelizing where he was from a place that the apostles had not gone to yet. And so again, what is the theme of this passage? It's evangelization. It's missions. It's God bringing the gospel through this case, Philip, to the uttermost parts of the earth. So emphasize that. Is it important that he got baptized? Yes. Are there some important things we can learn about baptism in this passage? Yes. But the key to this passage, why the Spirit of God moved Luke to put it in, to his historical account of the church is to demonstrate the gospel going from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria to the uttermost parts of the earth. Um, now, having said that, we get back to the passage, and I mean, I it's just I would love to have God drop some of these things into my lap. He runs. He he comes to this man who the Spirit of God, the angel leads him to and this man was coming back from jerusalem he was the worst he was an old testament proselyte in other words he was he was converted if you will to old testament judaism even though he wasn't a jew so he's studying the scripture he's worshiping in jerusalem he's going back home he's um reading of all places isaiah 53 and verse 7 and 8 is quoted in verse 32 and 33 here of Acts. And Philip simply asks a simple question, which is great for evangelization. Just ask a simple question. In fact, there might not be a better question to ask in witnessing than this. If you're in a situation where someone's reading the Bible or they've been reading the Bible, you say, do you understand what you're reading? Well, this man says, well, how can I unless someone guides me? Folks, there's nothing that difficult about witnessing. You're just guiding people through the Word of God. You're telling them what the Word of God says. You don't have to be fancy about it. You don't have to have great illustrations. You don't have to be argumentative. You shouldn't be argumentative. But what does he do? The passage of the Scripture is Isaiah 53, verse 7 and 8. Verse 32 and 33 demonstrates that. And the eunuch said to Philip, About whom, I ask you, does the prophet say this? about himself or about someone else. Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. What did he tell him? Jesus fulfilled this. This is a prophecy about Jesus. And he went on, no doubt, to elaborate on that. Um, and again, that's you, can, you don't always have to use a certain formula like the Romans road, which is great, or whatever. Just open the scriptures explain to people what Jesus has done for them. 
Um, so then we get to the baptism part. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? Now, this is where things get interesting. I'm reading from the ESV. Um, I don't know what you're reading from. The curriculum uses a CEV. I, I don't read the CEV. I have no idea what the CEV does at this point. But the ESV skips verse 37, which is a really interesting thing because it's a significant verse. But whenever you see a verse skipped, it's not because the editors are trying to compromise anything. There's simply a textual question of whether or not verse 37 should be in was part of the original. Verse 37 basically says this, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Now, the ESV includes that in a footnote. If they were trying to be at all uh, compromising about Scripture, they wouldn't do that. There's simply a textual manuscript issue here, which I don't have time to deal with in, in these videos. One of these days, I will do maybe a long session or something on that. but Or maybe I'll just teach that when whatever opportunity Pastor Jamie gives me. But... The bottom line is this, even if it's not part of the original manuscript, it's certainly part of the answer. And the scripture is very clear in other places that unless you believe in Lord Jesus Christ, you, that's what you have to do to be baptized because baptism doesn't save you. Um, he commanded the chariot to stop and they both went down uh, into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Now, it would seem to me that verse 37 is part of the original text because it it doesn't make sense otherwise in the sense that um, he asks a question and there's no answer recorded. Philip obviously answered him. So I think that along with whatever the you know issues are regarding the manuscripts would lead me to believe that verse 37 is part of the original text. But... Either way, let's get what we learn about baptism from this passage. He commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. Of course, a lot of people believe uh, baptism, different modes of baptism, different purposes of baptism. Today, we're at the St. John the Baptist Basilica in Savannah, Georgia, and when you walk in, there's a little pool, you know, of holy water that supposedly that you can sprinkle and put on your forehead. And it's also what they use to, to baptize. But in order to baptize this man, they had to go down into the water. And then in verse 39, they come up out of the water. Well, that implies immersion. You don't need water at all. They were in a desert place, uh, which obviously doesn't mean there wasn't any water. But all you would have had to do is take a, a flask, whatever they used to carry water in, and sprinkle it on his head if if baptism was that form. No, they went down into the water. They came up out of the water. You see the same thing described in the Gospel of John when John the Bapt Baptist was uh, baptizing in Aeon because there was much water there. So you've got baptism following salvation. You've got baptism by immersion. And then you have... A uh, really interesting thing happened here. Uh, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away. That's rapture. It's not the rapture you're waiting for, but it was a little rapture for him because the rapture simply is a Latin term. In the Greek, it means to be caught up. And so he's caught up. He disappears. He's found, verse 40 says, in Azotus, preaching the gospel, evangelization, doing his job. While the eunuch saw him no more, verse 39, and went on his way rejoicing. And I believe, again, the scripture doesn't tell us any more about him, but he did more than just rejoicing, I'm sure. As a, as a believer now, rejoicing, he's going to go to, uh, back to his homeland, to Candace, the queen who he serves, and he's going to be sharing the gospel. So again, evangelization. Missions is the theme of this passage and um, some good instructions about baptism as well. Well, I hope that this has worked for you uh, here from Tybee Island in Georgia, and I will be back tomorrow evening in town, and I'll see you on Sunday.